welcome everyone to this evening's panel series called Hope and Possibilities. My name is Carrie and I'll be your moderator this evening. And a bit about me is that I do have personal lived experience with mental health issues. I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety about 20 years ago and have lived uh, on medication series of medications trying to tr find the right one over the course of 20 years. I finally, through medication, peer support, therapy, exercise, and a whole series of things have been able to stabilize my moods. I have a fantastic job now, um, a wonderful family, lots of great friends. Um, I'm thrilled to be moderating this evening with all of my friends here on the panel. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce to you our first speaker, Christine Liebert. Christine has chosen a career of service to people for over 30 years and has contributed to supporting individuals and families across the lifespan. She has a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Western Ontario and a Certificate in Change Leadership from E. Cornell University. Christine is a leader in the not-for-profit sector focused on recreation, community development, early years, health promotion, mental health, and addictions. She's passionate about lifelong learning and bringing one's whole self into the work that she does. Thank you so much for speaking this evening, Christine, over to you. Thank you so much, Carrie. Hello, everyone. My name is Christine Liebert. I have many identities in life. For this moment in time, I'm going to share a part of me that I am courageously claiming, celebrating, and befriending. Please allow me to introduce you to my anxious identity. Most days, we have a harmonious relationship. However, some days, we have a long, rocky road that requires extreme nurturing and emergency assistance. Emergency assistance, SOS. Hmm, great way to organize this presentation to all of you. Throughout my lifetime, I have found myself in dire situations of distress beginning around age six. Although not in Morse code, I activated SOS signals in my own way to call for help. Over time, I have progressively expanded my personal emergency response knowledge resources, and skills to develop my own SOS toolkit. To all of you who are here with us in this moment, it is my sincere honor to share my SOS moments and my life preserver, which I will refer to as my SOS toolkit, with all of you. My SOS moments. Although I do not have any memory of my early years, I do know that they were not easy for me, nor for my mom, or younger brothers. I would not have been able to activate an SOS signal on my own, but I am certain that I would have if I could have for myself and for all of us. I was very fortunate to have love from my mom, my aunts, and my nana. As I turned four, I had the opportunity to participate in a pre-kindergarten pilot project. My mom signed me up. My teacher's name was Mrs. Friend. Perfect name for a first teacher and perfect support for me. I loved school. I mean, I really loved school. It was my haven. Supportive, stimulating, and safe. School was my rock, my steady foundation. My mom would walk me to and from school in those days. Those were very special moments. The next several years are not quite easy for me to recall. Our home life was very chaotic. Sad, stressful, and rife with anger. Actually, rage. Nothing was solid. No one was safe. School was overshadowed by my first SOS. Around the age of six, I was abducted overnight by a stranger who lived a couple of blocks away. I prayed incessantly 23 of the 24 hours that I was trapped in that house. I knew that if I died, I would go to heaven. If I lived, I believed there was a reason and I had work to do here on earth. My captor set me free in the morning. 
He told me to run or I would never leave. I ran so fast that I lost my peanut shoe on the way home. I don't know if you remember peanut shoes. They're kind of like clogs or hard crocs. They were my favorite, a treasured gift from my aunt. I became engaged in the court system and received incredible support from the detective in charge of my case during every step of the process. I never forgot about his kindness and the feeling of security that he provided. After the sentencing, I did not know how to make sense of the events of the kidnapping nor the justice system. I had complex feelings of fear, guilt, betrayal, loneliness, and isolation. I wanted to talk about it to whomever would listen. However, the advice my mom received was not to talk about it. The thinking of the day was that I would forget about it. My parents' marriage ended and my mom had a new loving partner who would become my stepfather. We moved and started a new life. Our family life was good, nurturing and healthy. I had a new school with great teachers and wonderful friends. Life was good for about a decade. My second SOS signal was sent in high school. I experienced my first breakup with a boyfriend. This loss was intense for me. I became extremely depressed. I thought that one of the reasons for the breakup was because I wasn't skinny enough for him. I stopped eating full meals. I would eat crackers and drink water. This continued to the point of my noticing irregular menstrual cycles. My mom accompanied me to our family doctor. He was very kind and treated me with respect. He asked me one question that pierced through the emotional pain that was being exacerbated by me starving myself. Do you want children one day, Christine? The answer was an emphatic yes. If you continue to do this to your body, he said, you may not be able to have children. Imagine hearing that. This newfound information prompted me to change my course of eating for a while. Through my 20s and 30s, I had several more SOS calls for help. I experienced times of extreme anxiety and periodic times of depression. As an alternative to anorexia, I turned to bulimia for a period of time. It was through these years that I was able to slowly build my life preserver, my SOS toolkit. I sought support from a therapist for the first time in my early 20s. I read voraciously on spirituality and self-help. I was happily married and a mom of two wonderful sons by the age of 32. I was confident that all mental crises were behind me. That was until my late 30s. As I wound down my third decade in life, my world became increasingly stressful and I entered into a dark time of intense anxiety with the thread of depression woven through. I was able to work, but even the smallest task was incredibly difficult. It was so hard to think clearly and my confidence and sleep were nowhere in sight. It was at this time that I received medication for the first time. I had a supportive physician who thankfully took time to talk listen, and was willing to work with me as a partner in my care. Unfortunately, the first medication that he prescribed had a very negative reaction. It actually intensified my anxiety and depression. I remember feeling like a caged cat. I was on the brink of hopelessness. A colleague urged me not to give up on medication. Her wise words helped me to keep trying. The right medication is like a lock and a key, Christine. Please trust me. She said, keep trying. Once you find the right one, you will know. I was desperate. I tried crisis lines, but I was out of district, so they couldn't send anyone. SOS signal required. I took matters into my own hands and went to the emergency department. I was able to receive a new prescription. She was right. Hello, Christine, my brain said. I missed you. I was finally able to reconnect with me. Have you ever had that feeling of reconnected with yourself? The true you who seems to have been gone for such a long time? 
The past two decades, my 40s and 50s, brought a couple of additional SOS moments in time. I've had to take time out for me to recover from burnout and symptoms related to perimenopause. The hotter my hot flashes were, the more intense my experience of anxiety. For those midlife women out there, I know that you know what I'm talking about. I've come to meet you here today by being a member of Peer Talk in my 53rd year of life. I wanted to find a way to contribute as a peer to those who have similar life experiences. I wanted to strengthen my voice and claim ownership and pride in all of the hills and valleys of my life. I wanted to come together with other wise and strong individuals like all of you to collectively bring voice to mental health and mental illness. The values and opportunities of Mood Disorders of Ontario, MDAO Hope in Me, are the perfect fit for me. In every SOS circumstance in life, I have carried with me what worked and added it to my recovery toolkit. I have had supports from family, friends, healthcare providers, therapists, my workplace, and a very kind detective. I have accessed bibliotherapy, always reading, still always reading, listening to music, and leaning into my faith. In the spirit of SOS, I organized my supports based on these three letters. S stands for spirit and or soul or hope. For me, this was music, prayer, meditation, mindfulness, and nature. O represents ownership or me, owning my journey to wellness. I had to do my part, reach out, show up, and do the work required to recover. S, the second S that is, is for supports, like MDAO Hope in Me, family, friends, therapists, healthcare providers, medication, employee assistance program, reading, self-care, accessing mental health and addictions programs and services, like the services provided by MDAO Hope in Me. This toolkit has worked for me, and it just may work for you too. All right. Thank you, Christine. That was absolutely beautiful. And, you know, it, it's so important for all of us to find those magic people in our lives. You know, you found your teacher at a young age, you found the detective. And I think, you know, something to take away from this is it's such a personal journey and where you find the strength um, that feeds your soul, like you said in your first S, is so important. And to continue to reach out and advocating for yourself and fighting for yourself. Um, unfortunately, with mental health, it's not, you know, always, a, it isn't a simple fix. It's a variety of solutions that we put together, you know, as our toolkit to, to maintain our health. And so thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. It was absolutely beautiful and I know there's a lot that people uh, will have taken away from that this evening. Thank you. So next I'm going to move on to our uh, next speaker and his name is Justin Brass. Justin is a recent graduate in psychology at the University of Guelph. He is passionate about breaking down stigma, stigma towards mental health as a whole and in the areas most relevant to his own life. Justin's goal is to continue advancing this conversation in the arena of through, pardon me. Justin's goal is to continue advancing this conversation in this area through peer talk and to speak to his lived experience. Justin is an LGBTQ plus disability relationships and BDD advocate. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Justin. Please go ahead. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. I wanted to start with a quote I found this week on social media that resonates with me. It reads, a happy person isn't someone who's happy all the time. It's someone who effortlessly interprets events in such a way that they don't lose their inner peace. By speaking today about my experiences with mental health, I hope to empower each of us to reflect on the ways that we see, intake, and overcome adversity in our own lives. Through my journey, my goal is to increase transparency in the conversations of how each of us tackle our mental health and how we speak to ourselves, as this is a process that can sometimes feel like a never-ending battle. 
Today, my speech is focused around my journey with Crohn's disease and how it has challenged my inner peace and how these two factors have been in interplay with each other for a majority of my life. I hope to speak about this particular focus of my life today as the lessons I've learned from my experiences have truly enhanced the ways I combat the remainder of the challenges I face in my life. By the end of our time together today, I hope that all of us can take some time to ponder what does inner peace look like in each of our lives? And if we have not found it yet, what can we do to get there? These are some questions that I would like each of us to reflect on. My inner peace became challenged when I was only 15 years old. During this time, I was dealing with a considerable amount of physical pain in my stomach and for many months without any understanding of what was happening to my body. As a teenager, I would go on to ignore my physical pain as long as I could. And eventually, the buildup of my physical symptoms started to impact my life, which eventually resulted in me missing school to stay home because I was feeling unwell. This further led to many late nights where I would be awake, reeling in physical pain and crying because I was blaming myself for the mysteriously painful sensations that were coming out of my body. It went on for a few months after this series of events that my symptoms got worse and I was hospitalized. Soon after, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. As a teenager at this time, I did not fully understand what it meant to deal with the disability, as all I knew was that I wanted my health to improve quickly so that I could move on with my daily life and resume school with my friends. Once I was told by my doctors that Crohn's disease was incurable, I soon realized that my life was going to change and my inner peace was being challenged. I started treatment through medication and eventually my physical pain subsided. However, even as I grew up, I still struggled to recapture my inner peace again. In particular, the next few years of my life only got worse as the medication I was placed on caused me to experience rapid weight gain, which led to scarring up and down my stomach and body. This was a hard point in my life as every time I looked in the mirror, I was reminded of the experiences that I had been through. I often refused to accept that life was going to be different than my peers, and I struggled for a long time after my diagnosis because I did not want to feel different. In fact, I tried in almost every aspect of my life to hide any additional challenges I faced as a result of my condition. This was because I did not want people to think that I was broken. These feelings surfaced again during a specific counter that has stuck with me for a long time. It occurred when I returned to high school after my first hospitalization. At this time, I started my medication and my body was already showing symptoms of scarring on my stomach, my arms, and legs because of weight gain. And I remember the way that my friends looked at me. And I never forgot how my best friend looked at me and said, Ew, cover up your body. I do not want to look at that. At this point in my life, I was still frustrated and I did not understand what was happening to me. I often became mad at myself, mad at others, and mad at the world as my condition was impacting my life socially as well as mentally and physically. It was not until I reached university that I eventually realized that pretending my condition didn't exist only hindered my emotional growth. This is because I tried for many years to pretend that there was nothing inherently wrong with me as the stress I was causing to myself, both on my mental and physical health, took its toll. My mind was controlling my body, and my body was controlling my mind in unhealthy and damaging ways. In consequence to this, I became hospitalized because of my condition several more times over my youth, because of the weight of my emotional strain and how it was impacting my physical health. I realized that this chaos I felt was plaguing my life in ways that I did not fully understand. And it only added to my paranoia up until university, as I held my worries throughout my degree that someone would find out about my disease and perhaps prejudge me based on labels such as incapable, abnormal, or inferior. Again, as a result of this, this only led me into experiencing many darker moments in my life that would lead to anxiety, stress, or challenges with my other social identities, which ultimately stemmed from my insecurities over feeling like I had no control over my body. However, 
it was at 18 years old that I realized that the key to resolving my chaos was not directly related to my disease at all. In fact, the real challenge in my life was learning how to love myself for who I was, imperfections included. As I am sure many of us have heard the saying, love yourself before, it is often easier said than done. However, I eventually started to pay attention to my thoughts whenever I would become anxious or upset and how these thoughts impacted my physical and mental health. I tuned into my body and allowed my mind the opportunity to speak freely. And what I heard was that it wasn't other people who weren't accepting of me that caused me to feel insecure. It was me not accepting myself in my current state. I soon realized that I was keeping myself inside what felt like a storm, and I was ignoring a greener pasture that was just over the horizon. My friends, my family, my peers, they had always volunteered their support for me, even when I did not listen. And I had created a world for myself where I felt like I had to survive by being alone. However, it's taken me till now to realize that I was so focused on hiding my true self away from others that I had never stopped to realize where the chaos I was developing was truly coming from. Once I finally grew tired of the control that the chaos I had built had on me, I decided to not back down and instead to challenge my beliefs. Once I made a conscious effort to start checking my thoughts and monitor the ways I practiced inner peace, I soon found comfort in knowing that whether I was happy, sad, or struggling, that there would always be support from the people who liked me, no matter who I was or what the status of my physical health meant. In doing so, I reclaimed a good chunk of my inner peace. Eventually, my thoughts calmed and my physical symptoms subsided completely, and I soon realized the healing powers of self-acceptance. I realized that inner peace in my life revolved around this self-acceptance, as I struggled for many years to realize that my fears were only much larger when I let myself sacrifice my peace of mind. Since the darker moments in my life, I have now reclaimed my physical health, and I continue to lead a successful and fruitful life. Moving forward, I remember to not give in to the rumination or the fear that who I am or what my condition will mean for me in the future. While there are many aspects of my journey that are far from over, I continue to push myself to have these conversations with others, as not all of us are ready to speak about our mental health, and that's okay too. I continue to lead my life not with per perfection necessarily, but with the freedom to allow my chaos a small portion of my time and to keep it away from impacting the rest of my life. In doing so, I look forward to continue working on my mental health. I look forward to continuing going through school and pursuing a career in psychology. I look forward to finding my balance. I look forward to making an active choice to continuously reclaim and maintain my inner peace as often as I can for my experiences have provided me compassion. I continue to speak for those like me who are not ready to speak. And as I navigate my future, I give a smile to myself as I see my life filled with rich hope and possibilities. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Justin. Thank you. And thank you for speaking up. You know, like it just, it really speaks to the fact that uh, warning signs of mental distress do show up early and to be looking for them and looking for them in other people, you know, and be an advocate, as I said about Christine, a self-advocate or advocate for those who can't speak up for themselves at that time. I know what, um, as far as inner peace and managing, you know, one's inner state is so difficult with the chaos that goes on around us, but especially when it's happening in your mind, it's, it's debilitating. And it's so nice to hear that you're at a place where you have, uh, have found self, not just found self-acceptance, but are aware to continue working on it and working with the tools that you have and speaking to other people. And I think that, you know, the more we give away, the more we get back. So I really thank you for your speech tonight. And uh, thank, thanks again, Justin. And I'm going to introduce to you our final speaker of the evening. This is Bart Campbell. Bart is a motivational speaker, an advanced level RAP facilitator, a management consultant, wellness educator, and life coach with over 30 years of leadership experience. 
Bart studied human resource management at Ryerson University and has a master's of education degree in adult learning from Yorkville University. He holds certificates in peer support, coaching, and mentoring and leadership. Bart is passionate about mental health and wellness. By being open about his personal journey, Bart hopes to inspire those suffering in silence so that they can break free from self-stigma to recover and find total wellness. Thank you for being here this evening, Bart. Please go ahead. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to our American friends and those who are probably joining online virtually from down south. Uh, as uh, Carrie says, my name is Bart Campbell and I am a wellness recovery and program uh, facilitator uh, uh, on contract with Hope and Me. For today, I'd like to share my rap story. So, so it, for this particular session, I'd like to share my rap story because I really believe in wellness and recovery and I wanna share it in that context. Uh, why is this important? Mental health challenges has been part of my family for many generations and resulted in numerous dysfunctions. At an early age, I decided I'm going to work hard, become educated, wealthy, and remain focused on staying healthy mentally and physically. And this would cure my mental illness. I would not fall victim. Now, despite experiencing abuse, abandonment, and several life traumas in the years that followed, I achieved my goal, and I was ready to enjoy life. However, hard work, education, the ideal job, fancy cars and houses were not enough to prevent things from breaking down and my life falling apart. Shortly after uh, being hospitalized, I participated in my first rap workshop and I fell in love with rap because it gave me a framework to manage the ebbs and flow, as I call it, of my mental health challenges. So now let me tell you about rap and you'll see how it works for me. Well, rap first and foremost stands for wellness recovery action planning and the rap curriculum and co-facilitation cool practice was developed by a group of uh, people who had been dealing with difficult feelings and behaviors for many years. People working together to feel better and get on with their life. What is now known as RAP was conceived by these group of peers in Vermont in 1997 and led by Marilyn Copeland, PhD, that beautiful, nice, smile, warm, grandma looking face that you're looking at is Marilyn Copeland. <laughs> now, RAP is an evidence-based practice. So it's one of the top peer support program that is doing all kind of amazing things across the world. RAP has been well researched and it, uh, it being evident based, it means it's proven to help people feel less stressed, more confident and better able to talk with care providers and more in control of their personal wellness. In RAP, we believe that there are no limits to recovery. In 2010, RAP was recognized by the United States Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, also known as SAMHSA, as an official evidence-based practice. So what is involved in RAP or the recovery process of RAP? There are four parts to the, the mental health recovery and it starts with one, the five key concepts. Number two, the wellness toolbox. Number three, the actual RAP plans and there's six of them. And then there's other recovery topics that you can apply the same principles to uh, for RAP. And uh, if you wanna be more specialized that you can uh, choose to do as well. So let's look at them individually. We'll start with the five key concepts. So as you've seen on the previous screen, they're hope, personal responsibility, education, self-advocacy, and support. What is hope? Well, hope means you can get well and stay well for long periods of time. You can work towards and meet your goals. You can lead a happy and productive life, especially when you believe in it. And what is personal responsibility? Sometimes it means taking back control of uh, things that you've lost, rights, et cetera, from those who have taken responsibility from you. Now, achieving this will contribute 
to our overall wellness and happiness and as well as life satisfaction. So be to be more specific, personal responsibility really reflects that you are the expert on yourself. You know what you need, even if you don't believe it at the time, but through some peer support and partnering and researching, you will you learn that it's up to you to take response, personal responsibility for your wellness and your life. Education. I thought at first education meant get degrees. And as you heard, I got lots of them. But really and truly in the context of rap, rap, education means to learn all you can about yourself, about treatments, lifestyle, career, relationship, living space, leisure time, etc. I was 45 years old before I walked into a movie theaters on my own just to enjoy a movie because I didn't feel it was my lifestyle. And that's one of the best thing I do now. Then there's self-advocacy. This really means that I have to be, believe in myself and that came with time. So become a strong advocate for yourself. This means going for it with courage, which means act from, act from the art, with persistence and determination, expressing yourself clearly and calmly until you get what you need uh, for yourself and then believing in yourself. Some of the examples of course are goal setting, et cetera. Last but not least of the five uh, key concept is support. So it's, it, you will benefit from developing a very uh, strong support system. And so having five good supporters and they could be friends or they could be uh, um, family members or they could be uh, care providers. These are people that will talk to you, listen to you, share with you, cry with you and have fun with you. Being supported will help you feel better and enrich your life. You will benefit also once you're uh, able to uh, feel better and start to uh, you know, benefit from some of the things that you've learned to share as well. So you can also provide support at some point in, in ways of paying it forward. So those are the five key concepts. Then there is the wellness toolbox. So these are things that you do to keep yourself well and things you do to help yourself feel better when you're not feeling well. For lack of a choice of better term, some of these things that I call hobbies or bucket lists, just to use familiar terms. But to be more specific from a rap perspective, it means getting help and support from others. It could mean peer support. It could mean exercising and sleeping, which is part of self-care, some stress reduction exercises. And as I've mentioned before, it could be any hobbies that you do that helps you feel well and help you feel better when you're not feeling well. And of course, healthy eating is quite important as well. So when you, once you have your wellness tool all listed out and ready to go, now you're ready for your wrap plans, which is the third part. So it start with daily maintenance plan, trigger slash stressor, early warning signs and action plan, when things are breaking down an action plan, crisis planning and post-crisis planning. I'll go through those very quickly at a high level uh, so you can understand what's involved. So for daily maintenance plan, our daily maintenance list, there's three sections to it. So one, describing yourself when you're well. Believe it or not, for the first 40 years of my life, I did not know what that felt like. I thought working hard and amassing things was good for me, but that's not what it is. So I had to do self-discovery. What do I like and what am I like when I'm well? Then a list of things that you do to keep yourself well, and those come from your wellness toolbox. And a list of things that you need to do occasionally. So things you need to do every day in the section two and section three, things you need to do, not necessarily every day. You can do them every day if you choose to, but more so occasionally. Of course, despite our best effort, triggers arise and triggers are external events that make us feel uncomfortable and cause a negative bout of em emotions, but it can be challenged challenging to manage that at times, but we need to see it as normal reaction. However, if we don't respond to them, sometimes they help us make us feel worse or cause us to be in crisis. Here's some examples. Could be problems at work. Could be difficult relationship. Failing to establish work-life balance, just to name a couple. And so then the sample plan now, if it's problem at work, well, you can talk to your EAP, your boss, or a trusted coworker. If it's relationship related, you can choose to talk to a family member, or a friend, a doctor, or a spiritual advisor. As a general rule, make sure 
you do or I do things for my daily maintenance list and review my wellness toolbox and see if there's some things I haven't tried yet if I'm really triggered. Then there's the earliest warning signs. Most of us sometimes knows that we're, we're something's off with us. You've heard the term, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. You, you, you just woke up and like, I'm in, I'm in a low mood. Well, early warning signs are internal sign, uh, signs that may be unrelated to any kind of stressful situation. They're subtle sign indicating that a change may need to be made and you need to take some further action. Here are some examples of early warning signs of forgetfulness, anxiety, nervousness, et cetera, et cetera. And these are out of the norm. It's not things that you normally experience. And so again, so as a sample plan, if you're having forgetfulness, you will surround yourself with loving and affirming people that's gonna help you, right? If you find that you're anxious or nervous, maybe it's time to take a mental health day to just celebrate you, okay? Again, general rule, do things for your daily maintenance list and try something new if you haven't tried some things for a long time. Then, of course, uh, th there are times when things are breaking down. So despite having uh, wellness tools, having a plan for each day, recognizing when you're triggered, knowing, okay, early warning signs comes on. Sometimes, like in my case, my challenge with major depression, severe anxiety, panic attacks, and hearing voices. Um, I don't know about the hearing voices part, but all the other parts are genetic based. And so no matter what I do sometimes, things do get worse. And so it's important at that time to recognize that I need to take immediate assertive action to prevent a crisis. And sometimes you start with making a list of my feelings. Here are some examples. If I can't concentrate on work tasks, if I'm losing track of what I'm doing, if I'm feeling oversensitive or fragile, and of course, here are some sample plans to help you if you're in that situation. So I might need to call my doctor or my care provider because it's serious. I can't, I, a, a friend won't help me at this stage. I might want to arrange to not just take one day off work, but maybe I need to take three days off work. And of course, when I'm feeling better, that's when I revisit my daily maintenance list and assess some things that I can start using to help me feel better. But when things are breaking down and getting worse, it's time to take some serious action. Even when you've done your best in that case, sometimes we still end up in a situation where there's crisis, right? This is the last part of our wrap plan, really. It takes you a while to write this plan because you have to do it when you're well. And it, it, it pays to do it slowly. There's nine parts to, to the crisis plan. And it starts with, what am I like when I'm well? So with the wrap, it's your personal wrap. You normally don't share it with anyone, the six wrap plans or the, the first uh, four wrap plans, but the, the crisis plan is something that you share with somebody. So it's important to tell your friends, family members, caregivers that, hey, this is what I'm like when I'm well. And number two, here's what, uh, when people need to take over. And it's important also to know who you don't wanna be involved because not everyone can handle crisis. So sometimes the five people that you have as supporters are different when it comes to your crisis plan. So you might just need somebody to talk to and care for you uh, in, your, in the support category. But then when it's in crisis, you might need somebody to walk your dog, do your banking, et cetera, et cetera. Always have a list of medication in your crisis plan so folks know what, what kind of medication you're taking, what kind of treatment. If you have to go somewhere, uh, would you prefer to stay in the community? And if you, if, if, if you are gonna choose to go to a facility, which one do you prefer? And what are some other things that people can probably do for me? So maybe some folks can do grocery shopping, some person can help you clean your house, et cetera. And last but not least, things that wouldn't help me. So please, if, if, if I am having a bout of crisis, it doesn't help to say smarten up and snap out of it. That won't help. So now coming out of crisis, there's a post-crisis plan. And this is a time of healing when we do some reflection. So although we may feel ready, we might need to assess how ready we are, assess some of the feelings we have. And there's three parts to that. So, you know, what, what do I need to do to return after crisis? You know, you know, what did I learn during the process? 
Uh, who do I need to change on my support list? Uh, what does resuming responsibility look like? And sometimes that includes uh, who do I need to apologize for? Because some persons, when they're in crisis, it's a tough time and they may say and do, did some things that were not so nice. Of course, up front, I told you that there's part four, which is other recovery topics or recovery topics. And as you can see, there's building self esteem, changing negative thoughts to positive, peer support, work related issue, et cetera. You can apply the exact same principles of the sixth plan following this. So when you need to do deeper uh, work on yourself to help build self-esteem, deeper work. I heard my friend Rustin referring to uh, CBT, which, which looks at changing that hot thought. Well, these are some activities in changing ne negative thoughts, a positive one that are very similar. Peer support, work-related issue, et cetera. So my friends, I've shared the Wellness Recovery Action Plan and how it gave me hope and the steps that I, I took to recover. And it gave me the opportunity to, to enjoy all that's possible in my life. And for that reason, this is why I believe in wellness and recovery. Perhaps you've started the work already. You've been doing rap all along, not calling it rap, or you've done rap, or you're just starting. If so, keep working on it. If not, it's the best time to start because Knowing is not enough, we must apply. And willing is not enough, we must do. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Bart, so much for that amazing talk. So good to see your face. <laughs> In the chat, uh, Madeline will put some details about the RAP program specifically and um, what's being offered in December through MDAO if you are interested in the RAP program. So there is more information if you feel like you know, Bart gave you so much information that you just need to, to, to parse it off a little bit. But I really want to point out, you know, it's hard to believe who you are today. And it's hard to believe who any of the panelists are today. You know, if you look back during crisis or, you know, your shame filled existence, which always happens when we live in our heads, um, all that fear. And now, you know, you're moving to fact based living. And, and Rustin spoke to that as well is that, the, you know, you change your you change your mantra to what is and what it, and um, it really has a uh, really big impact for us and you know we're only as sick as our secrets so asking for help going out and getting help from people is really um, key to moving past the state we're in but I really want to thank you as well for showing us that recovery is a lifelong endeavor. It's not as simple as a one-off. We are constantly working on it and it's exhausting. There are reasons we go back into crisis and need time out. I mean, look at what that, you know, nine stages here and this and that, and it has to happen in order for us to live a, a whole and complete life. But all of it is um, is definitely worth it. And the final thing I want to thank you for, and I think that you know a lot of us probably knew it intuitively as we were growing up, but didn't recognize it until maybe a diagnosis, is the familial aspect to mental illness and mental um, recovery. Those of us who grew up in sick houses, you know, sick people make sick people. And um, so, you know, while there is a, the familial um, thing, it can be broken. The pattern can be broken. It can be broken with you. And, you know, you can choose to live a different life. So thank you so much, Bart, for that. And thank you to all of our panelists and fabulous um, lived experience that you shared with us. So thank you. Thank you to everyone who participated this evening. Um, I want to thank everybody in the audience who joined us this evening. Um, again, in the chat, please uh, reference the RAP uh, information that Bart spoke to. And thank you for joining us, as I said. So please fill out our survey and sign up for our newsletter so we can make you aware of future webinars. The survey link will be included in the follow-up email that you receive. We look forward to hearing your feedback and absolutely to do this again uh, on this dark and dreary November uh, evening. It was great to be together as a group talking about, you know, commonalities as opposed to differences. So it was really great to have everyone, all the panelists, and thank you for hosting this MTAO. Have a great evening. <laughs>